Good morning. Thank you for joining us today for the inaugural webinar of CHOP's new virtual educational series entitled Clinical Advances in Pediatric Oncology Seminar Series. I'm Ann Riley. I'm the Medical Director of the Cancer Center here at CHOP. We are very excited by the enthusiasm and the number of people who have registered for today's seminar, as well as for the other eight upcoming lectures in this series. We believe this webinar series is a new way for us to connect with you, our regional, national, and international professional partners and colleagues. I'm particularly delighted to introduce today's topic, which focuses on clinical advances being led by CHOP's innovative program on comprehensive vascular anomalies. This is a team that is led by an international expert in the field, Dr. Denise Adams. Dr. Adams and the members of the CVA program will discuss new therapeutic approaches and multidisciplinary care strategies for children with complex vascular anomalies. We have left a lot of significant amount of time at the end of today's lecture for questions and for a panel discussion. Dr. Denise Adams came to CHOP in June of 2020 from Boston Children's Hospital, where she co-led their Vascular Anomalies Center since 2016 and served as an associate professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Before joining Boston Children's, Dr. Adams served as the medical director of the Hemangioma and Vascular Malformations Center at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, where she spent 13 years and led the Pediatric Hematology Oncology Fellowship Program. Previously, she was a faculty member at Duke and the University of Vermont. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Denise Adams. Thank you very much, Anne. It's, um, I'm very honored to be here to lead this presentation. Um, today, we're going to talk about innovations in vascular anomalies, how a multidisciplinary disease approach can change the outcome for rare disease. And we will talk about the advances that our Comprehensive Vascular Anomaly Program has made. Um, our outline is an introduction, which I will give on the team approach and also a classification of vascular anomalies. Sarah Shepard will talk about genotype and phenotype correlation, and then we'll hand over to Hakan Hakanarsson to talk about translational research, followed by Yohab Dori and Abav um, Saravasan, who will talk about innovative procedural intervention. Kristen Snyder will then end with drug therapy, and we'll have a panel discussion um, for all of your questions. Before I get started, there was a wonderful introduction, but a team is not a team without the team members. And I think it's really important for you all to know that I could not do this without the members of our team. And you see, this is, these are the core members are, of our team, but the circles show the leaders of our team. And it's very important to note that the leaders are senior investigators as well as junior investigators, because our junior investigators are our future in CVAP. And so Hakan Hakanarsson is the director of the Center for Applied Genomics. Um, he's also the co-director of the CVAC Frontier Program. He has made some amazing discoveries in the genetics of rare disease and has made some amazing discoveries in the genetics of vascular anomalies. Um, Finn Srinivasan is one of our interventional radiologists. He has been an amazing asset to our team and has led innovation in particular diagnoses such as FAVA and also um, arterial venous malformations. Yohav Dori um, is the director of the Jill and Mark Fishman Center for Lymphatic Anomalies. Um, Yohav has moved the bar ahead with the diagnosis of lymphatic anomalies, diagnostic techniques, and also intervention. And then more importantly for all of us are the younger members of our team who will in the future be the leaders of our team. And so we have Sarah Shepard, who is an MD PhD who trained in Dr. Hakanarsson's lab. She's a clinical geneticist who will talk about genotype and phenotype correlation. And Kristen Snyder, who I was her mentor, though she does not need a mentor any longer, who's a hematologist, oncologist, and associate director of the, of the um, clinical aspect of CVAP and she's going to talk about therapeutic interventions. And this, again, is the rest of the core group of our team. And when I think about comprehensive vascular anomaly groups, I think that they all need a leadership team, which is sort of in the boxes up above, with an executive committee, which is your core group. But also there are core, there's a core physician team, which is made up of some of these specialists. 
But in a multidisciplinary center, every single specialist in pediatrics and also in adult medicine needs to be represented, and that's our ancillary MD team. We also could not do this if it wasn't for the proficiency of our administrative team. And so here we have an amazing program manager that leads the team. We also have an intake coordinator. And then going along with that, we could not do that with the rest of our clinical team, which is our um, advanced practice PA and also our nurse navigators. With this, we need other ancillary support, such as genetics counselors, social workers, OTPT. And then in order to move things forward, we also need a research team, which is made up of a core leadership team, but also the ancillary research support that we are very grateful to have here at the Cancer Center. So I have been doing vascular anomalies for about 25 years, and I always think about when I was a fellow and started this at Duke, um, when I was in my fellowship, we started a clinic there, and what I had and what I had now. So I started this because of a dermatologist who had clinic the same day as I did. And when, I'm think, when I think about what I had as a young Hemonc fellow, I had pattern recognition. I had a very simple classification system. We had a lot of surgical and interventional procedures. We had very limited medical options, which was very frustrating to me as a pediatric oncologist. There were no clinical trials and there were no cooperative groups. Now I can say that our classification system has advanced tremendously. We now have standards of practice. We have these multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary centers. We have more medical therapies. We have better defined phenotypes that we can now link with genotypes. We have clinical trials, which to me is amazing. And we also have biomarkers. So very simply, I'm going to go over the classification system. So in 1982, one of my mentors, John Mulliken, who's a plastic surgeon at Boston Children's, um, came up with a very simple classification where he defined vascular anomalies as tumors or malformations. And tumors were diagnoses that were proliferative. And malformations were congenital issues, and they were classified as either low flow, such as lymphatics or veins, or high flow, such as capillaries or arteries. And then ISFA, which is the International Society for the Study of Vascular Anomalies, also started in part by John Mulliken, got together. And I have to say that initially, I went to my first ISFA meeting in, the, in early 2000, I think in 2002, and I was one of two HEMONC attendees. ISFA meets every other year and is going to meet every year starting this year. And there are over 150 registered HEMONC attendees at that, which is pretty amazing. So ISFA got together and formed a scientific committee um, and talked about how we can better define vascular anomalies. And so it was broken down into vascular tumors, again, which are benign, intermediate, and also malignant. And this is very similar to the WHO classification. And then vascular malformations, which are simple, combined, or associated with other syndrome, syndromes. So here's a picture of a hemangioma, which fits under a vascular tumor, a bit of a more complicated hemangioma. And then a hemangioma, which is infiltrating into the liver, which is a diffuse hemangioma, which I think acts sometimes more like a cancer. When we talk about more intermediate risk uh, vascular tumors, we think about caposiform hemangioendothelioma, which is considered an intermediate risk tumor without malignant potential in the WHO classification. When we move over into vascular malformations, we can have simple malformations like capillary malformations, and also lymphatic malformations, venous malformations, and um, also a, a bit more complicated malformation, and then a more complicated capillary malformation. And then we also now can have syndromes which are associated which are with a much better phenotype and are associated with genotype. So we have phenotype-genotype association, which leads us to better medical management. And some of these are a syndrome called Klippel-Trenone, 
which is a capillary lymphatic venous malformation. And you can see in this picture, the capillary malformation with lymphatic blebs, the overgrowth with some dilation of veins. And that is a typical PIK3CA mutation. We also now have something called CLOSE, congenital lipomatous overgrowth with vascular anomalies and epidermal nevi. Um, this is also now characterized as PROSE, which is PIK3CA related overgrowth spectrum. And this is a patient that has PROSE. So you see this patient over here has just lipomatous overgrowth and the typical features of the, of the foot that I think Sarah will talk about versus this patient with the same diagnosis, but also has a vascular malformation. And you can see the implication of this lesion into the spine and also the overgrowth, which is causing scoliosis. And this is a PIK3CA um, problem. So this, pur this purposely links the next step of this talk, which will be Sarah Shepard talking about genotype phenotype correlation. Thank you, Denise, for that introduction. Um, so just sort of thinking back, I just first wanted to touch about why genetics is actually important. Um, you know, I think that's a question a lot of families actually come into our clinic saying, why am I even seeing you? Um, and really, the genetics is super important to actually be able to pinpoint a diagnosis. Um, and it allows us to really direct the medical care. Um, so now we know you know, we're able to screen for additional anomalies that we might see with a specific condition. And really what, what some of our focus is going to be on today um, that Dr. Hakatterson and Dr. Snyder are going to talk about more, is that the genetics really enable us to give a precise treatment to our patients. Um, it also allows us to give our patients a prognosis. So how will their disorder evolve over time? Um, and, you know, it also is a, allows us to give um, our adult patients um, an estimate of the recurrence risk. So is this going to happen again um, in their children? Or for parents bringing an affected child to clinic, um, do they have to worry about having another child with the same medical issue? Um, and finally, I think something that we often forget about that we can't really measure the value for um, is giving families an answer. You know, certainly there's, I think, a tremendous value to give a mother um, reassurance that it wasn't, you know, that marathon she ran during, on a hot day when she was pregnant um, that caused this in her child. Um, so I'm gonna, just going to give a couple cases of things that are, are now treatable diseases and things that you wouldn't necessarily want to miss. Um, but certainly this is not, um, uh, certainly this is not um, as many different genetic diagnoses as you would see. Um, so the first case I wanted to talk about is an infant that was born after an uncomplicated pregnancy um, and found to have this diffuse capillary malformation over um, his entire body. Um, and when you examine him, you notice that he also has some lateralized overgrowth, really of the whole left side of his body, um, including the face and the cheek. Um, and this should make you think about sort of two different conditions. One is diffuse capillary malformation with lateralized overgrowth, um, which is really just what it sounds like. Um, and that's due to somatic variants in GNA11 or GNAQ. Um, and then the second condition that it should make you think about is PIK3CA related overgrowth spectrum disorder, um, which I'm going to go into a bit more. Um, so both of these conditions are actually somatic conditions, um, and I think most people are probably familiar with autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive inheritance, but I did want to go over somatic mosaicism as this is a really important concept when we think about these genetics of vascular anomalies. Um, so these are somatic variants are those that arise after the two-cell stage of embryogenesis, and in this figure, they're noted by these blue cells here. Um, and as the embryo grows and divides, um, those cells with those mutations in them kind of propagate throughout the embryo as those also grow and divide. Um, and as you can see, as the embryo grows and becomes the tiny person, um, the areas with the mutation are then represented still by these blue areas. Um, and so mosaicism really means that we only see the phenotype and that, that's due to that genetic change 
in those specific areas of the body with that genetic change. And this is really important um, in thinking about recurrence counseling, but also in getting a diagnosis, um, because really you need this affected tissue specimen to have uh, the genetic testing done um, on, and otherwise you won't get a diagnosis. Um, so again, PIK3CA is one of those disorders, um, and we see the difference um, really in the phenotypic severity based on where we see the tissue st specific distribution. Um, so PIK3CA can be related with a lot of clinical phenotypes, um, such as just simple muscular hemihypertrophy, macrodactyly or enlarged digits, um, and then all the way to some of the more um, involved phenotypes, such as megalencephaly capillary malformation syndrome. Um, where even sometimes, actually, um, I have had patients where I found it as high as 33% in the blood, um, which is very high for what you would consider a somatic condition, and we usually don't find anything in the blood. Um, so I just wanted to show you some of the phenotypes that should make you think about PIK3CA overgrowth spectrum disorder um, within the vascular realm. So Dr. Adams touched on this a little bit. Um, but cloves are congenital lipovenous overgrowth with vascular anomalies, epidermal nevi, and skeletal or scoliosis. Um, it's really a very debilitating condition. Um, so you get these large areas of lipomatous overgrowth, as you can see in this individual here. Um, she also has epidermal nevi. And so these individuals will often have surgical management to remove these lipomatous overgrowths, um, but unfortunately, the majority of the time they recur. Um, they can be quite debilitating, causing scoliosis. Sometimes they can have fast flow lesions um, within the vascular, within this lipomatous overgrowth themselves, um, or throughout other areas of the body. But when you know those vascular malformations are within the lipomatous overgrowth, they can often render those areas, um, you know, surgically inoperable, um, which is where medical management becomes really important, as Dr. Snyder is going to talk. About. Um, one of the other types of vascular anomalies we see in PIK3CA related overgrowth spectrum disorder, again, as Dr. Adams mentioned, is um, the clippel trenani phenotype where we have these capillary malformations, usually deeper lymphatic or venous malformations, and usually lateralized overgrowth. Um, and this is also a condition that can be really um, amenable to medical management. Um, uh, so when we see diffuse capillary malformation, sometimes we think about megalencephaly capillary malformation uh, syndrome, which is part of this PIK3CA phenotype. These individuals have large heads. They can have large brains, or even maybe half of the brain is enlarged. They can also have polydactyly, as you can see here, syndactyly. They may have um, a sandal gap of the foot as well. Um, and then PIK3CA is actually a really common cause of lymphatic malformations. So these isolated macrocystic and microcystic lymphatic malformations, as you can kind of see here on this tongue or even here with this um, individual's neck. Um, and so when we think about PIK3CA, it's um, really important in the, the mutations that we actually see. There's a handful that we see that are activating mutations. And really what it does is it actually works to increase signaling through this AKT mTOR pathway. Um, and what we know now is that we're really lucky to have medications that actually act at each step of this pathway to kind of tamp down that activity. And Dr. Snyder is going to talk about that a little bit more in detail. Um, but this is really important to note because now we can consider some of these phenotypes due to PIK3CA as treatable conditions. Um, the second case I wanted to talk about was um, an infant that comes to your clinic um, who's been referred for uh, red cafe au lait spots. Um, and when you take the family history, mom says, you know, oh, I have these um, birthmarks too. Um, and it turns out the maternal grandmother also has a history of a hemorrhagic stroke. And so on your physical exam, when you take a look, you see these thumbprint capillary malformations and this pale halo of sort of um, lighter skin around them. And that should really make you think about something called capillary malformation or arteriovenous malformation syndrome, which is due to monoallelic germline pathogenic variants in either RASA1 or FB4. Um, so we consider this to be an autosomal dominant. Um, this is a really important to recognize because these individuals um, may also have arteriovenous malformations within the brain or the spinal cord. Um, and so 
um, we usually will recommend MRI, MRA. Um, you know, there's not firm recommendations right now if you don't find anything on the first screening. Um, however, our neurologist at CHOP that we work with um, rescreens our individuals every five years if nothing is found at diagnosis. Um, so the third case I just wanted to touch on was an individual that presents for an arteriovenous malformation. And when you review the medical history, you find out that he has autism and macrocephaly. Um, and on your physical exam, you actually do confirm the macrocephaly, but you also find a very small soft mobile mass that's on the left back that you think could be a lipoma, as well as freckling on the penis. Um, and it's super important to identify this disorder as uh, P10 hamartoma syndrome um, because these individuals have a risk of cancer. Um, so specifically in the children, we would be thinking about the cancer predisposition for thyroid cancer, um, which you would start screening for immediately. Um, and this condition is due to monoallelic germline pathogenic variants in P10. So this is also an autosomal dominant disorder. And about 50% of these individuals have vascular anomalies, um, which really mostly are fast flow anomalies, but you can also see developmental venous anomalies in the brain. Um, and if you see any sort of vascular anomalies with excessive ectopic fat or something that is called a P10 hamartoma, that should also make you think of P10 hamartoma syndrome. Um, so the final case is an infant that has a central conducting lymphatic anomaly. So this is an infant that was born at 32 weeks um, after a pregnancy that was complicated by high drops um, and a fetal arrhythmia. Um, and after birth had an MR lymphangiogram performed by um, Dr. Dory, who we'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, and you can see the contrast kind of spilling out all into the mesentery and in the lungs. Um, and so um, Dr. Connorson will talk about um, sort of all of the different genetics that we see in central conducting lymphatic anomaly, but the most common uh, diagnosis that we see is actually rasopathies. Um, so these are conditions that are generally characterized um, by congenital heart disease, short stature, various types of developmental delay, and these characteristic facial features, so these down slanting palpebral fissures, um, the low set posteriorly rotated ears, oftentimes um, short and wet necks. Um, and these are due to monoallelic pathogenic variants in um, many genes that really work to increase signaling through this RASMAP kinase pathway, um, which we'll touch on in a little bit. Um, you know, the other phenotype that's really important that we think about in terms of vascular malformations with the rasopathies is lymphedema. Um, this can be quite debilitating. Um, and you know, really uh, needs management as well. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize this because I think when people see individuals with lymphedema, they often think about primary lymphedemas, but it's really important to consider whether or not you would have um, a rasopathy in your differential diagnosis as you'd continue screening these individuals um, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as they get older. Um, so again, this increases signaling through the RASMAP kinase pathway. Um, and what we know now and what we've shown in our group is that we can actually use this treatment of a MEK inhibitor like trimetinib to really tamp down that signaling. Um, and Dr. Snyder is going to talk about that a bit more as well as Dr. <coughs> Um, so just in, in summary, I think it's really important to think about all of the clinical pieces that you see on your physical exam as your phenotype can really direct what kind of genetic testing you need to send. Um, and it's really important whether to consider what type of tissue you need, whether you're considering um, an autosomal dominant or recessive condition, or whether you're going to need to send effective tissue to get a diagnosis. Um, and then finally, really, this having a genetic etiology is really amazing now because we're able to think about some of these disorders as treatable disorders, such as PIK3CA-related overgrowth spectrum disorder and the rasopathies. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hakonarsen now. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Sarah. So I am going to review with you uh, some of the translational research that we have conducted on behalf of the team uh, that have basically uh, led to sort of the uh, driving of precision-based therapies uh, in children with uh, congenital vascular and lymphatic malformations. 
um, who have specific uh, uh, genetic uh, mutations. And as uh, Dr. Dennis and Shepard uh, reviewed with you, uh, uh, generalized lymphatic and muscular malformations, they are complex disorders and they range in severity from, from mild to highly severe. They can become malignant, such as the Kaposi-form uh, uh, lymphangiomatosis, or KLA, uh, and the most severe cases, they can actually become uh, fatal. And uh, when we started this work a few years back, there was very little known about uh, uh, vascular malformations in terms of the genetic underpinnings. There were some uh, anecdotal cases at the time with somatic mutations in the PIK3CA uh, pathway uh, that activate the mTOR signaling. And seralimus had been used sort of anecdotally to treat some of these patients, and Dr. Adams was actually sort of the lead of that uh, work in the uh, uh, back back in, uh, at that time. And uh, molecular diagnosis was was actually missing in, in in most of the cases. And and one of the uh, uh, first family actually that sort of you know came to our. Uh, 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 clinic at the time uh, was, was this uh, fourth generation uh, family pedigree. And, and as you can see here, here's the proband uh, labeled uh, uh, with the uh, dark uh, square with the arrow. Uh, and and, and in, when you have a, uh, a pedigree like this, you look at the her inheritance model and it sort of appears to be an autosomal dominant uh, based on the inheritance. And often when you have multiple sort of generations of patients with the same disease, the severity tends to get worse sort of further down in the pedigree. And this uh, lead proband, uh, he had, he was actually born with uh, very significant high drops. Uh, he developed serious uh, chylothorax bilaterally. He needed to be drained uh, on multiple occasions. Uh, uh, but the family sort of, you know, what, what was interesting uh, was that there was both a venous malformation uh, seen in the family as well as lymphatic malformation. And there was one stillborn baby born with, uh, with high drops. Uh, uh, but the etiology of this was, was unknown at the time. Uh, here you can see the uh, imaging from, from the lead proband. The x-ray shows that there is opacity here in the uh, right uh, lung. Uh, so so uh, it would appear to be an infusion, which is confirmed here on the CT scan. You see a thick rim. Uh, of uh, chylothorax uh, with patchy atelectasis and sort of fluid in the in the lungs, and the uh, uh, MRI lymphangiogram shows fluid here in the in the pericardium, in the lungs and, and belly, uh, and you can see this sort of very abnormal, torturous, dilated uh, uh, central venous uh, uh, duct uh, and, and abnormalities. And we co collected uh, 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 DNA samples, uh, actually from blood, blood, blood collection from multiple family members. And, uh, and Dr. Dong, who is uh, one of our lead uh, uh, analysts in the, in the group, he identified a mutation on exome data. This was a splice altering mutation that led to an insertion into the, um, uh, into the gene with sort of a stop uh, stop code, and uh, so so uh, it was predicted to cause uh, uh, a loss of function, and it segregated perfectly uh, with that uh, autosomal dominant sort of inheritance pattern. And uh, FMB4, uh, which is the gene that carries this uh, mutation, uh, is actually interesting because it's involved with uh, multiple uh, sort of developmental processes, including vascular development. Uh, and uh, Efrin uh, uh, sits here sort of on the interface of the venous and the lymphatic system, and the lymphatic system develops from the veins, so one can envision that you may have both uh, lymphatic uh, and uh, 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 venous malformations uh, if, if you have a mutation uh, in that gene. The ligand is Efrin B2, and it's a critical gene, as I said, uh, in, in, in vascular uh, development, mostly on the venous and lymphatic uh, side. And since this was a loss of function mutation, uh, in our translational effort in the beginning, we, we actually took a Zebrafis model and we knocked out uh, this gene in Zebrafis. Here you see the uh, uh, sort of the normal fish in early, early development. And when we knock out the gene, you see this sort of caudal defect, swelling, this is actually 
uh, vascular lymphatic vascular uh, uh, congestion. Uh, and what we also see is that the normal branching, this is the central duct here, the normal branching of the lymphatic system becomes very thick and sort of uh, uh, dilated and torturous. And you can see that better here on the schematics in terms of uh, the misbranching uh, and the caudal defect uh, uh, compared to the, uh, the uh, control. And if we look at the molecular underpinnings of this, um, there is actually, here is the uh, uh, mutation state, here is the uh, wild type state, uh, and you can see that uh, there is induction of the mTOR, phosphorylated mTOR, uh, and the P70S6 kinase, which is sort of a key kinase uh, con conveying the signal from the mTOR signaling to a proliferation of a cell, uh, is, is induced. Uh, but you note also that if we treat uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, cells here, uh, or the fish with, uh, this is actually a, um, a, a lysate extract from the zebra fish, if you treat the fish with either rapamycin, we, we shut down this uh, 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 phosphorylated kinase uh, signal completely. Uh, and, uh, and there's another compound here. This is a combined uh, PIK3CA kinase and mTOR inhibitor, which shuts this down also uh, completely. So there's a significant rescue in this model when we, when we use the, uh, uh, these uh, drugs. Now, here's another case, a very interesting case, actually. Uh, this was a 12-year-old uh, boy. Uh, he had actually been on Suralimus uh, with uh, basically no response. And had presented about two or three years earlier with a rapidly deteriorating course of swelling uh, with uh, pericardial effusion, as you can see here on the lymphatic uh, MRI, uh, uh, swelling of the lungs, uh, uh, swelling of the belly uh, and intestine, and and uh, here the uh, you can see the uh, uh, the lymphatic system that there is a dilation here of the. Um, uh, of the central uh, duct, uh, very substantive, the retrograde flow into the portal system and sort of throughout the, the abdomen. And then you see that sort of this torturous, swell, swollen, dilated duct up in the thorax, uh, where you where you where you on a uh, the box here is sort of showing here in a in a better resolution. You see a very dilated thoracic duct at the end, and there are these. Uh, uh, sort of, you know, sprouting into both directions that leak fluid into both uh, both lungs uh, that cause uh, chylo chylothorax uh, in this uh, instance. And uh, we were fortunate, and this was Dr. Uh, Lee again, who identified this uh, mutation in the ARAF gene uh, in, in the patient. We referenced this as patient one. Uh, and, and fortunately, we had actually another patient who had the same type of lymphatic uh, disorder, uh, uh, patient two here, and, and this patient uh, was a female, a bit older. She had exactly the same mutation as the first patient, which really speaks for that, uh, that this mutation is driving the condition. And if you look at the ARAF uh, gene here across different species, this is a highly conserved uh, uh, region, so a mutation in this region would be anticipated to be poorly tolerated. Um, and if you look at what uh, ARAF uh, does, ARAF is actually a RAF kinase, a member of a family of RAF, RAF kinases. Here's ARAF, BRAF, CRAF, they all do similar, similar things. But this signaling is not involved with the mTOR and the AKT mTOR signaling pathway uh, that you showed uh, previously. This one is actually involved with the RASMAP kinase part of this on the other side here and drives upregulation of MAC, phosphorylates MAC and ERK, uh, and, and leads to a proliferation of multiple sort of cellular uh, activities in the, in, the, in the cell. And if you look at the molecular changes here, the, uh, uh, the mutation actually, uh, ARAF binds with this 14.33 pan kinase, uh, and, uh, and, and this leads to a disruption uh, basically, uh, of, from the interaction between ARAF and this 14.33 kinase. Uh, and with that, you get uh, markedly upregulated phosphorylated uh, ERK. And ERK is this 
the extracellular pathway that I showed you on the slide before. Uh, and unlike uh, the uh, PIK3CA or the mTOR signaling uh, that we showed before, there's no change in, in mTOR, there's no change in the P76 kinase or AKT, so this patient would not be anticipated to have perturbation in the mTOR or respond to sirolimus, and he did not respond to sirolimus clinically. Uh, whereas you see this very massive upregulation of the phosphorylated ERK. Uh, this is sort of, you know, cataloged here in the graph uh, in, in more detail. And, and what happens actually when we, when we have this uh, system here, this is uh, sort of our cell-based, these are vascular endothelial, lymphatic endothelial cells. And when we treat this sort of massively upregulated uh, phospho uh, ERK, uh, 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 here uh, in mutation with uh, trametinib in the mutated state, uh, you can see that you shut down the phosphorylation and you normalize this at doses that are sort of, you know, the achievable concentrations in the, uh, in the human being. And this is shown here on the graph uh, in, a, in a more, more uh, with better clarity. And we, we did use trametinib, we also used solumetinib, uh, cobimetinib, and a few other inhibitors, and they all did uh, the, same, uh, the same thing. And when we look at the effect here of this mutation on cell, sort of cell proliferation, we used the spheroid. Spheroid is sort of a cluster of cells. And when you mutate these cells, they grow these spikes, we call them sprouting. And you can see the difference here between the wild type and the, uh, and the sprouted cells. And when we give trametinib or cobimetinib or selumetinib or any of these inhibitors, you can see that you sort of shut down the sprouting activity of the cell as cataloged here similarly by the, by the graphs. And same holds true with vascular endothelium. You can see the surface expression here uh, of these uh, endothelial cells with the vascular endothelium very notably. And in the mutated state, this is the wild type, this is the mutated state, this surface expression disappears and you get sort of a chaotic structure. And when you treat this again with any of the MAC inhibitors, you, you essentially rescue the cellular states. You get the endothelial, uh, vascular endothelial expression on the surface, and the culture looks really, you know, as, as, as the wild type. Uh, and this is with actin filaments, regular sort of coordinated filament uh, uh, alignment here that becomes chaotic in the mutated state. And if you treat it again with a MAC inhibitor, you basically get a normal, uh, normal picture again. So this is actually quite. Uh, Quite remarkable. And here you see the wild type on top and the uh, mutated state for the ARAF uh, upregulated mutation overexpression, basically. Uh, and you see here widening, uh, misbranching, and widening of the central duct with very sort of abnormal uh, vasculature, uh, which is very different from the vasculature in the, um, uh, in the fish. Uh, uh, with the wild type. And cobimetinib was used in this particular experiment, and you can see that there is a considerable rescue. You can see the thick, thickened central duct and this sort of abnormal uh, lymphatic uh, 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 vascular uh, uh, sort of, you know, malformation here in the fish. If treated with cobimetinib, sort of really becomes much closer to normal, not totally normal. And you can see here that there's a very mild sort of, you know, portion of, of the uh, fish that is, uh, that is not responding and, and, and rescued uh, with this uh, approach. And this actually led to this sort of essentially a life saving because this child was going downhill very, very rapidly and basically there was nothing left to offer, offer him uh, uh, when we identified this, uh, this mutation. We got uh, uh, IRB approval and, and sort of single, single patient IND approved. And Dr. Balesco, who is uh, on our team, she actually treated this patient. Uh, and, uh, and you can see here on the MRI lymphangiogram, this very abnormal lymphatic sort of structure, as I showed you before, very swollen belly and chest. And, and remarkably, after just a few months of therapy, there is essentially a total remodeling of the lymphatic system. It is, it is like uh, almost unbelievable in terms of how rapidly this, this lymphatic system remodeled and the symptoms of the child uh, improved. 
And this was actually tagged as a, as a breakthrough discovery and development and received a, 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 an award actually from the Clinical Research Forum as a top 10 sort of clinical research achievement uh, paper in 2019, paper in Nature Medicine. And uh, there are multiple other mutations that have, uh, we have now uncovered. Uh, uh, this is just a fraction of them. You see here the ARAF, there are KRAS, there are BRAF, there are RASA1, SOS1, PTPN11, multiple different mutations, RAF1, RASA1, RIT1, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these mutations are now undergoing the same sort of a translational modeling work so we can confirm that there is a rescue uh, uh, in the cell-based or, or, or Zebrafish uh, modeling system, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and subsequently we take this, give this to the clinicians who, who uh, uh, under proper circumstances, would treat the patient if we see <coughs> that type of uh, response. So uh, with that, uh, I will, I will uh, close, and uh, Dr. Dory uh, will tell you about uh, his uh, 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 lymphatic center work. All right. Hi. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you uh, for Denise and ha Hakon for inviting me today to a little bit of talk about what uh, we do on the uh, uh, Lymphatic Flow Disorder Center. So uh, <clears throat> we're going to be hearing a lot today about genetics and lymphatic malformations. Our center deals more, deals more with uh, lymphatic flow disorders, and this is kind of a, a depiction of what we think about when we think about uh, the lymphatic circulation. Uh, there are, most of the fluid in the lymphatic system goes through the thoracic duct, which is the structure in the center over here. There are three main contributory streams uh, to this flow. One is coming from the liver, one is coming from the mesentery, and a fluid that comes from the lower extremities. Uh, in normal people, there's about two to three liters of fluid going through the thoracic duct draining in most people to the enamel vein on the left side. 40% of that comes from the liver, and 40% of that comes from the mesentery. Now, the reason why this uh, circulatory system was uh, largely ignored and was thought as, uh, as the forgotten circulation was that there was a lack of a good way to image it and a lack of an easy way to intervene on it, and so people kind of just ignored it. But I'm happy to say that that has changed significantly. And we've spent uh, a lot of time uh, over the past few years of developing uh, imaging techniques. This is an old imaging technique shown over here. This is called T2-weighted MRI. Uh, it is uh, very simple to do. It doesn't require contrast or access into any lymphatic channels. And it just looks at uh, slow-moving uh, water in the body. So in principle, in normal people, uh, this, most of the tissue should be dark. There's a little bit of fluid in the stomach over here. You'll see fluid in the, uh, surrounding the spinal column. Uh, but other than that, uh, everything should be dark. This is a good technique to give you an, uh, some general ideas about uh, uh, the anatomy or the static anatomy of the lymphatic system, but it doesn't tell us anything about the dynamics of the lymphatic system. And if you're dealing with a circulatory system, and I, my background is also in cardiology, so uh, when we uh, uh, characterize that system, we always think about uh, hemodynamics or lymphodynamics. We think about flow and we think about anatomy. But this is a good uh, screening technique for anatomy. Not so good if you have edema in the tissue, then distinguishing between lymphatic channels and edema becomes a problem because the contrast can be poor. A new technique that is relatively new now, it's uh, a little bit older that we've been doing for a while. This is the first imaging technique that really allows us to see the dynamics and the flow inside the lymphatic channels, inside the central lymphatic channels. This is what's called intranodal dynamic contrast lymphangiography, and in this technique we inject contrast in uh, lymph nodes in the groin. And you can see over here what a normal uh, imaging would look like. So these uh, channels that first lit up over here were channels in the lumbar area, and then connected to the thoracic duct and the thoracic duct. And I don't know if I can play it again. Uh, no, it's not playing again, but you'll see, just a second, I'll move it there, there you go. So that is the thoracic duct linear structure going up and ultimately connected to the left. As I said uh, in the previous slide, uh, there's two main streams that are connected to the central uh, lymph system, and historically, we had a really hard time viewing those, and that is the liver uh, flow that is connected to the duodenum in the pancreas and the mesentery. 
which historically really has never been imaged in humans. But I'm happy to say that we now routinely image all those compartments. And this is what we call intrahepatic dynamic contrast in physiography. <clears throat> and in this modality, we inject contrast in lymphatic channels in the liver. You can see flow into the retroperitoneum and then ultimately connecting to the cisterna chile into a thoracic duct. And this is what a relatively normal uh, intrahepatic uh, imaging would look like. And this we uh, published uh, first use about a year ago. And as I said, I'm happy to report that now we've published also about the use of what we call intramesenteric dynamic contrast and tangiography. And this is what a normal would look like. So in this technique, again, we access uh, the mesenteric lymphatic channels and uh, inject gadolinium uh, under dynamic imaging. And you can see this is the mesentery over here flowing up, connecting to the cisterna chile and ultimately to the thoracic duct, which is draining to the left. So again, now we have the tools to image all real major streams of central lymphatic flow. And this gives us the ability to view many things that we were not able to diagnose before, especially uh, abnormalities in the uh, abdomen. And to show you an example of how, why these multi-compartment or multimodality imaging are so important, this is a patient that came to us a while ago with a, a, a lymphatic uh, a conduction abnormality who had congenital PLE. We did uh, intranodal imaging on him a few years ago, and you can see that intranodal imaging shows the lumbar lymphatics look pretty normal and the thoracic duct was completely normal. So the, <clears throat> the imaging itself was really uh, non-diagnostic. But when we did the uh, multi-compartment imaging in him, and you can see over here that when we inject the liver, the liver uh, is a very different flow pattern than what the, the intranodal pattern looks like. Liver is not connected to the thoracic duct that was going to the left, but instead liver was leaking a little bit, and the, kid, the child did have a little bit of ascites, but also liver connecting to a, a, a duct that was a right-sided duct. And uh, anatomically, this has been, this kind of flow pattern has been described, but completely disconnected from the central limb system, but doesn't show us anything about why the kid has congenital PLE. When we did the mesenteric imaging, then we got the diagnosis in the child. And you can see this is the mesenteric imaging. And in this case, the mesentery fills. But strikingly is that the duodenum uh, immediately fills with contrast and there's leak of fluid into the duodenum, that is PLE. But even more strikingly is that the mesentery was completely disconnected to any of the uh, thoracic ducts. So there was, a th there was mesenteric outlet obstruction with ultimate decompression into the uh, duodenum. And that was the cause of the problem in the child, which led us to do a, a innovative kind of hybrid surgical interventional approach. But you can see that in this child, these are dilated, uh, congested uh, lymphatic channels uh, connected to the, <clears throat> to the intestine uh, going through the mesentery. And that is completely consistent with the obstructed mesenteric outlet that we saw by imaging. And actually, this uh, hybrid surgical and uh, interventional approach actually helped this child and his albumin levels have gotten much better. There are many different interventional techniques that we use now. Uh, historically, most of our interventions were geared more towards obstructing things. Uh, and so we kind of think about it uh, uh, along those lines. There are interventions that are made to block leaking, uh, block uh, flow. Uh, thoracic duct embolization is a historically one of them. Um, but there are many others. Uh, there are embolization or blocking techniques that we do in the liver, uh, <clears throat> and uh, we can use stents to do these kind of things. So there's many different techniques to do that. There are new techniques and sometimes better techniques that we use uh, <clears throat> instead of blocking things, we help things uh, decompress. Like in that child who had mesenteric outlet obstruction, uh, it would be helpful in a child like that to reconnect the system. And we can use the, do those uh, <clears throat> using uh, different techniques. Uh, one of them is uh, lymphovenous anastomosis in, in, in nominate vein rerouting for kids who have a Fontan and uh, lymphatic flow disorders. And there's many different techniques coming down the pipeline uh, that are uh, related to decompression. So it's a combination of embolization or, or shutting down leaky places and decompression of the system that gives us really a complete spectrum of uh, interventional techniques to help these kind of children. And this is an example. So this is a child that had uh, both plastic bronchitis and uh, colothorax. And historically, we would maybe do a thoracic duct embolization, just shut down all the flow going 
uh, to the lung in this child. But this is a child who has uh, other problems and actually has a lot of flow through the thoracic duct. So shutting down the thoracic duct is not really uh, advantageous for this child. So in this child, we use a technique, which is a two catheter technique, uh, in order to do a selective embolization. You can see this is the channel that was causing the problem. We got a catheter in there, selectively embolized this channel. You can see after the procedure, this is the thoracic duct going up and actually connecting both to the right and to the left. Left it intact and all symptoms of this child resolved and he's doing perfectly fine and has uh, intact central lymphatic flow. We can't talk about all the different kinds of techniques that we'll do, but I'll just show you how we kind of think about it, how we use our imaging techniques uh, to kind of guide our uh, procedures, but also to check to see what is the effect of the procedures that we do. And these are the, uh, the problems that we think about when we think about lymphatic flow disorders in the chest. So there's chylothorax, which abnormality of flow or leaking into the pleural space, chylopericardium, uh, which is leaking into the pericardial space, and plastic bronchitis is just leaking into the airway. And this can be chylus, but lymphatic leaks can be non-chylus also if they're coming directly from the liver. And I'll show you an example of three patients that came to us, uh, all three of them with KLA. And in all three of them, you can see this is T2 imaging, and there's a very different imaging pattern in these patients. You can see in this patient, there's not too many abnormalities in the, in the, in the abdomen. Uh, there's a significant abnormality in the left lung, which is very wet. There's mediastinal thickening, which is very typical for KLA patients and largely sparing of the uh, right lung. In, in contrast to the second patient, who you can see that there is a high T2 signal everywhere. There's cutaneous edema, there's mesenteric edema, and then there's all over the lungs. And the third patient who has mediastinal thickening, lungs are largely spared, but still has a chylothorax at presentation. And you can see that these uh, T2 imaging correlates really well with the dynamic imaging. Okay, so this is the first patient, and you can see that the, the left lung is really involved. There's sparing of the right lung, except for the mediastinal area, very large torturous thoracic duct, versus the second patient who lost his thoracic duct and has retrograde flow in the, in the mesentery, in the liver, and crossing through the diaphragm all over the lungs, versus the third patient who had relatively good-looking T2 imaging, uh, who has what looks like a relatively normal uh, central lymphatic system. So when we look at these three types of imaging, right, when you have a child that has this, right, interventional procedures for a chylothorax, embolizing the thoracic duct in this patient could be very detrimental, right? And in a patient like this, multimodality imaging would be key because there has to be channels connecting to the lung causing the chylothorax, and a lot of times we see them coming from the liver. So that is for interventional planning. Once we do a procedure, for example, on a child like this, if we decided to do, instead of a selective procedure, shut down the duct, we can use our imaging to, uh, <laughs> to assess how good our interventions are. And this is a child presenting again with chylothorax, abnormal perfusion of the lung, several other abnormalities, underwent a thoracic duct embolization. There were multiple channels. There was not a clear thoracic duct over here. And you can see that post-procedure, uh, injecting in the lymph nodes in the groin, there's contrast going here, but there's nothing flooding the lung, and actually this child did perfectly fine after the procedure and is uh, doing well. Uh, we can also use this imaging modality to assess, like uh, Dr. Hakunarsen and Dr. Snyder will show you, the, the, the efficacy of uh, the, the drugs that we use, the trametinib or other MEK inhibitors, and Dr. Snyder will show you a few more examples of that uh, coming soon. So I'll summarize by just saying lymphatic flow disorders are serious, sometimes life-threatening, there's single and multi-compartment imaging is key, really, for the first step in diagnosing to guide therapy. Intranodal imaging in most of the patients that we deal with, uh, with GLA, KLA, and other kind of lymphatic abnormalities is uh, really not sufficient. You really need multi-compartment imaging to really characterize the main streams for lymphatic flow. There's lots of new treatments that are available, and targeted therapies are always preferable than, uh, than just uh, blanketly uh, embolizing things. And I'll end by saying uh, thank you, and uh, uh, Finn uh, will be the next uh, to talk about other procedures. Yo, thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, Finn Srinivasan, one of the uh, uh, members of the Intervention Radiology team. I will just be speaking about uh, uh, the more classically recognized uh, vascular malformations and how Intervention Radiology plays a role in management. Uh, sometimes in diagnosis and what uh, we can contribute to uh, for a vascular anomaly center. So what is IR? Uh, uh, most centers have uh, IR support, uh, but uh, uh, 
it basically is a range of techniques that rely on radiological Im image guidance to precisely deliver minimally invasive therapy. We use uh, X-ray fluoroscopic guidance commonly. In children, we frequently use ultrasound guidance, uh, sometimes CT and also MRI guidance uh, to, uh, uh, to do our interventions. And how is IR relevant to vascular anomalies? Well, uh, there are two, two air, big areas. One um, is for diagnosis. As our speakers earlier today have, uh, have indicated, uh, the acquisition of lesional tissues is becoming more and more important in managing uh, vascular malformations and vascular anomalies. Uh, so IR is becoming more important in, uh, in, in uh, delivering tissue. IR has also classically played a role over the last few decades in intervention of, uh, of the commonly recognized uh, vascular anomalies. And these interventions are scleral therapy, embolization, and uh, more recently, terminal ablations. And uh, interventions can be performed now in conjunction with all the pharmacotherapies that uh, our uh, speakers have highlighted today and also with surgery. And they can be performed on a variety of, uh, of uh, vascular anomalies, including uh, malformations, both, both malformations and tumors. So uh, just to go through some of these interventional classes here, uh, this is uh, 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 highlighting the role of biopsy in this patient an 11-year-old female with a very large right thigh mass. Uh, putative diagnosis based on imaging here, would, the, would this be a P10-related uh, uh, ha hamartoma of the soft tissues or a FOST? Uh, to confirm this, we uh, 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 did a biopsy, which is a, a pretty straightforward procedure that a lot of us are aware of. And then uh, based on uh, tissue characterization, this is actually a few years ago, uh, she was started on sirolimus therapy. The lesion uh, on follow-up is still present, but you can, you can note that the density of vessels is less, and there's a lot more uh, uh, fatty involution of the, of the primary tumor, and she's less symptomatic. Uh, regarding direct intervention, sclerotherapy is the kind of the, uh, the classic paradigm for uh, uh, minimally invasive intervention on vascular malformations. This is injection of a noxious substance in order to damage the endothelium. And the endothelium uh, we're recognizing more uh, is the driver for these vascular uh, malformations. So the uh, substance you inject into these lesions induces inflammation, then progresses to fibrosis, uh, hence the term uh, sclerotherapy. So just to highlight one, uh, one case, this is a neonate with a very large uh, cervicothoracic lymphatic malformation. Uh, you can appreciate how large it is. The patient underwent sclerotherapy, uh, 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 week of life one. Uh, this is drain-based sclerotherapy uh, 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 with, uh, with uh, multiple agents. And uh, this is a uh, follow-up shortly after, uh, after sclerotherapy, a few weeks after. You can appreciate here that the lesion uh, uh, with intervention has decreased in size pretty significantly. Uh, the patient did go on to, uh, uh, to uh, pharmacotherapy with sterolimus uh, for uh, further uh, resolution of the, of the malformation. So as I said, uh, interventions can be performed in conjunction with pharmacotherapy with a multimodality approach to uh, treatment of these lesions. Uh, venous malformation. So this is an 11-year-old uh, with a venous malformation uh, 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 of the, of the uh, humerus. Uh, interestingly, this malformation extended into the bone and caused... Uh, uh, a significant amount of bone pain uh, with uh, due to the malformation. Uh, just to highlight some of the you know special techniques that uh, uh, that our group has uh, uh, has described here. Uh, when you uh, perform the sclerotherapy, uh, the initial injection, you see that there is a rapid opacification of the brachial vein here in the humerus. Uh, in order to achieve effective sclerotherapy, um, you have to control outflow here to make sure that your agent remains within the vas within, within the target uh, target malformation, and it is uh, obviously difficult to control outflow when you have a main venous channel uh, uh, in close association with the, with the with the malformation. So one uh, easy uh, kind of elegant fix here would be to place a temporary balloon across the communication between the malformation and the main vein, and then proceed with your injection of the sclerosin. And this this is what we did here. Uh, and very uh, uh, kind of simple paradigm to highlight how we, how we uh, can use uh, minimally invasive uh, and somewhat innovative techniques to, uh, to produce uh, an effective result in, uh, in sclerotherapy. Um, other, other modalities we use, this is a patient with, uh, uh, with, with close uh, or, or KT syndrome, actually. We have a patient with, uh, this patient with overgrowth of the 
right lower extremity on the left side, uh, you can appreciate this uh, lateral uh, uh, embryonal vein that is extremely prominent here on, on this, uh, on this uh, photograph. Capillary and lymphatic mal malformation is also visible on the skin. Uh, in, in this child, uh, we becomes uh, imperative that we close this large lateral vein, assuming that there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's an intact deep venous system. The main reason uh, is that as the child grows, uh, this vein becomes increasingly incompetent and produces a, a very large risk for significant uh, uh, and life-threatening pulmonary embolism. So in this, ca in this case, we were uh, able to uh, use endovenous laser therapy to, uh, uh, to close this vein, uh, which, uh, which becomes uh, uh, a very important uh, uh, treatment uh, for, for patients with, uh, with uh, KT syndrome and large lateral veins or large sciatic veins. Uh, embolization is another uh, category of uh, procedures we, we perform in interventional radiology. This uh, involves occlusion of a vessel uh, com uh, completely from the endovascular uh, approach. These, this can be performed with particles, coils, or liquid embolics, uh, uh, commonly glue. Uh, so this is a one-day-old with uh, caposiform hemangiotelioma uh, of, uh, of the face and neck, extremely large lesion, infiltrative lesion, uh, had cuspoc merit uh, phenomenon, and in addition to that was in high output heart failure. Uh, uh, patient came emergently to interventional radiology for embolization. This is the initial angiogram demonstrating how uh, how large the lesion of this external thyroid artery is extremely large, very large tumor blush after uh, embolization of the lesion. The high, high output heart failure uh, resolved. The patient then was able to be started on chemotherapy uh, for the KHE and did uh, did very well after uh, uh, after after pharmacotherapy. So again, uh, highlights the role that IR can play in, um, in supportive care uh, with pharmacotherapy. 19-year-old with luteal uh, AVM, this is a more classic uh, intervention we perform for, uh, for more commonly recognized uh, vascular malformations. So this was a, uh, a high-flow lesion in the, uh, in, in the luteal uh, uh, musculature. Uh, patient was embolized. Uh, one session and uh, demonstrated uh, resolution of the AVM after uh, after embolization and uh, all the little squiggly things you see here are glue. Uh, so this uh, again is a uh, is a more standard uh, intervention that we perform. Uh, uh, more commonly, more recently, I should say, the uh, uh, cryoablation thermal ablation has been described for treatment of vascular malformations and uh, vascular tumors as well. This is image-guided placement of a cryoprobe to generate an ice ball uh, to induce lesional cell death. Um, and uh, the two, two areas I'd like to highlight, two interventions I, of intervention here would be for fiber adipose vascular anomaly. Uh, FAVA is a very painful tumor consisting of abdominal veins with a fiber fatty stroma, responds poorly to sclerotherapy, uh, and uh, common treatments are excision, serolimus, and also cryoablation. Again, uh, all of these can be performed uh, in conjunction with, with each other based on uh, anatomy uh, and, uh, uh, and symptoms on the patient. But uh, classically, if I was look like this, they're often intramuscular in the, in the calf uh, with these feathery appearance. This is a T2-weighted uh, image on T1. You can appreciate little strands of fat within the lesion. Uh, this is what it looks like on ultrasound, very large dilated veins. The real bright stuff around the, around the lesion uh, are uh, is fa fatty, uh, the, the fatty stroma you, uh, you have for, uh, for the tumor. Patient underwent sclerotherapy uh, first, but uh, did not produce um, long-standing uh, symptomatic relief and underwent cryoablation. This is an ultrasound-guided cryoablation. You see a large ice ball here. This is the probe coming into the lesion, and then uh, uh, ended up having a, a, a prolonged uh, symptomatic relief. The tumor uh, tissue itself is left in place. With ablation, but the the idea is to uh, is to uh, destroy the uh, viability of the uh, of of this of this lesion. Although it is benign, it is aggressive, and it's aggressive tumor. Uh, highlighting cryoablation for uh, for other uh, other vascular uh, anomalies. Uh, this is a 29 year old uh, with a very large intramuscular hemangioma of the right chest wall. Very long standing problem for this for this patient. Uh, she had undergone repeated episodes of, uh, of embolization. Again, not uh, uh, with sustained relief. This is the lesion here. You can appreciate exactly how big it is. T2-weighted axial sequence, very large uh, vessels feeding this, and then a lot of uh, bright signal within the 
within the tumor, uh, indicating edema, but all these little squiggly things are the large, large feeding vessels. So this was an intramuscular hemangioma, uh, likely capillary type, and uh, a patient did undergo cryoblation by Dr. Cahill, uh, who's uh, uh, a director of interventions here at the center. Uh, this is the ice wall again within the tumor, and uh, post uh, uh, post-procedure follow-up radio uh, photograph demonstrates a very large decrease in the tumor. The patient, of course, uh, will have to have staged uh, cryoablation. She's going to be coming back for repeat treatment. So again, very good result here uh, with ablation where other modalities did not uh, produce sustained result. So for the directions, uh, I think we would continue further refinements in, you know, in the granular aspects of techniques some sclerotherapy, embolization, and ablation. Uh, local drug, drug delivery is also promising, just as uh, as there's a convergence between treatment of vascular malformations and oncology, there should be convergence between classic techniques in interventional oncology and management, uh, interventional management of vascular malformations. Uh, local drug delivery, I think, is, is going to be something we will look for in the future using techniques in cryotherapy and, and embolization. Ultrasound assisted drug delivery is also something we're researching on. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Snyder, I think, is, uh, is, is up next. As Dr. Hakonerson and Dr. Shepard described, there are germline and somatic mutations associated with a multitude of vascular anomalies. Today, I will focus on the RAS, RAF, MEC, and ERK pathway and also touch on some treatments for patients here at CHOP in the PIC3CA AKT or pathways. As we know, the RAS, RAF, MEC, ERK pathways associated with a multitude of vascular anomalies, most of which are AVMs, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, capillary malformation, arterial malformation syndrome, and Parkes-Weber syndrome. But also, as we've learned today, primary lymphedema, and other lymphatic conduction anomalies are associated with the RAS pathway. One such patient that's also been already been described uh, was, dis was um, written by authors here at CHOP as well as colleagues, and they reported the treatment of a 12-year-old with an ARAF mutation and a complex lymphatic anomaly with severe lymphedema that you can see on the right-hand side of the screen who was unresponsive to conventional therapies. This patient was treated with trametinib and remodeled his lymphatic system. Since this time, several other patients have similarly been treated for RAS pathway mutation driven vascular anomalies at CHOP. Patients with vascular anomalies and known causative mutation were referred to our vascular anomalies oncology division for treatment. These patients had diminished performance status failure of conventional therapies, such as failure of fat, low-fat diets, failure of serolimus, and no alternatives for interventional or other procedures. Patients often had a poor quality of life, necessitating frequent hospitalizations, frequent clinic visits, frequent albumin or red blood cell transfusions. Patients who had comorbidities and organ compromise, including renal failure, did not initiate treatment until those improved. Treatment with trametinib was dosed at 0 0.01 to 0 0.25 milligrams per kilo per day and administered orally to these patients or by nasogastric or gastric tube. A two milligram maximum daily dose was allotted, except most patients were treated with about one milligram of treatment daily. And treatment was a continuous 28 day cycle. Common toxicities that occur with trametinib were monitored for, as well as rare toxicities which occur with trametinib. These include diarrhea, acneform eruptions, fissuring of the skin, and laboratory abnormalities. Rare toxicities were also monitored for, including colitis with or without perforation, left ventricular dysfunction and arrhythmias, increased creatinine phosphokinase levels, and chorioretinopathy with retinal vein occlusion. In our first patient, after two months of treatment, he had improved pulmonary function testing, as seen on the diagram at the right. After three months of treatment, he had a decreased need for supplemental oxygen and reductions in lymphatic fluid retention. 
After 12 months of treatment, his total lung capacity improved from 29% to 56% predicted and his forced expiratory volume in one second from 23% to 42% predicted. And as mentioned, he had lymphatic remodeling and restructuring of his lymphatic system. Adverse events included skin dryness and flaking. He did develop a small bowel obstruction with adhesions and volvulus, but this was not felt to be attributed to the drug, but instead due to multiple abdominal um, procedures that he had had throughout his life. Our second case is an 18-year-old with a Sybil mutation in refractory composiform lymphangiomatosis. She had disease in her mediastinum, her lungs, her breast tissue, axilla, spleen, and sacrum, and spine. She had severe restrictive lung disease, dyspnea, orthopnea, cough, and was able to exert herself only for activities of daily living. She was no longer responsive to serolimus, prednisone, or vincristine. She was started on a small dose of tremetinib, only 0.01 milligrams per kilo per day. But after four weeks of this treatment, she was already beginning to train for a 5K, and her dose was um, never increased. She had improvements in PFTs, her magnetic resonance lymphangiography, as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen. And as mentioned, she was able to train for a 5K. Side effects included a grade one acniform rash, and quickly resolving eosinophilia, hematuria, and proteinuria. Our third case is a male patient with a lump that was noted on the forehead at about two to three years of age, which enlarged until he was nine when it was excised and found to be consistent with an arteriovenous malformation with a MAP2K1 mutation. He had a recurrence of this lesion at age 10 and was treated with embolization and cryotherapy. A new lesion then occurred on the posterior head soft tissues that was also consistent with an ABM on imaging, and he was started on tremetinib at 0.02 milligrams per kilo per day, which was 1.5 milligrams daily. After four weeks, he de developed some mild toxicities, and the dose was reduced to one milligram where he has remained. From an efficacy standpoint, he's had no recurrence of the forehead lesion and resolution of the postoccipital lesion. He developed grade one diarrhea and an increase in creatinine phosphokinase, some mild scalp itching and lid cramps, and edema of his face, eyelids, and hands, all which quickly resolved. Now, if we focus on the pic 3 ca AKT mTOR pathway, Dr. Shepard described the clinical findings associated with patients who have pic 3 ca overgrowth syndrome. Globes is one such syndrome that you've heard mentioned today already, the congenital lipomatous overgrowth with vascular malformations, epidermal nevi and spinal or skeletal anomalies, and scoliosis. It was described as a unique entity in 2009, and patients have lipomatous, lipomatous masses of the trunk, retroperitoneum and pelvis with deformities of the digits, and a wide clinical heterogeneity. It is due to mutations in the PIK3C8 gene, which now fall under the PROS classification. We now are able to offer patients here at CHOP treatment for their PIK3CA related overgrowth syndromes. In addition to our investigator initiated trials, we are now treating patients with PIK3CA inhibitors on a MAP study, a managed access protocol study. We will soon be opening a phase two prospective study for patients with probes. We'll also be opening soon a PIK3CA topical first in man study for patients with cutaneous vascular anomalies due to PIK3CA or TEC mutations. We are involved in a MEK inhibitor study for patients with complicated ABMs, and we are also working with industry who are developing new agents for PIK3CA inhibitors and mTORC 1 and 2 inhibitors. We are also part of Canvas and are offering our patients a DOAC versus low molecular weight, um, low molecular weight heparin study, evaluating the quality of life in patients with complicated vascular anomalies. As I mentioned, we are part of Canvas, which is the Consortium of Investigators of Vascular Anomalies. This is a national consortium of pediatric hematology and oncology programs at major vascular anomaly centers. There are 16 sites currently, and two patient support groups are involved. 
Our aim is to improve clinical research for patients with vascular anomalies. Currently ongoing are the coagulation trial for complicated vascular anomalies and a patient registry for patients who have vascular anomalies and develop COVID-19. This is an international patient registry. In addition, we will be initiating a prospective study of safety and efficacy of bisphosphonates and mTOR inhibition for complex lymphatic anomalies. In summary, elucidating the genetic causes of vascular anomalies is imperative to offering therapies for generations of patients with vascular anomalies. Newer, targeted agents have been administered using a genetic rationale for treatment with promising results. TOP is at the forefront of this multi-step process. Gene identification, efficacy of basic science concept, proven benefits in our patients. In the future, we will continue our interdisciplinary efforts. We will continue our membership with Canvas and continue to develop disease registries and tissue repositories. We will also anticipate further discoveries with cell-free DNA, drug delivery, and clinical trials. Thank you to all of you who are able to attend this talk today. On behalf of our entire Comprehensive Vascular Anomalies group, thank you for that. We also thank our patients and our families. Without them, this work would not be possible. We thank our patient and our family support groups, LMI, LGTA, KT support group, Clove Syndrome Community, and NOVA, and our funding sources, the FDA, NIH, LMI, and UPenn Bank Grant. We also thank our institutional support, the Frontier Program, our various hospital divisions, and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Please feel free to ask questions. Thank you very much. So um, now we are going to open up for questions. Um, we have the panel sitting here, and if you all would like to um, type your questions into the chat box, we can start from there. An interesting um, question, and this is from Brett Yarksover. Um, what is the incidence and prevalence of these anomalies in Pennsylvania, and how do affected people find centers of excellence? What is your experience in obtaining coverage for medical treatments like trametinib and sirolimus? That's a very good question. Um, do you want me to start? Or? Why don't you start? Okay. Brett. So, um, Brett, that's a, that is a difficult question to answer. So, um, I've been involved in... Um, uh, applying for many grants, and we don't have incidence and prevalence in general for these vascular anomalies. That's why we need more historical data and registries. Um, we can basically, and we're in the midst of doing this now, trying to figure out how many patients we actually see hospital-wide with these diagnoses. And, and unfortunately, what that means is that these are congenital problems, so they start in the pediatric population, but now they're actually going into the adult world. And so, um, you know, we only, we, we need historical data from our pediatric um, registries, but also we need data from the adult groups. So we're trying, we haven't been, um, you know, but this is a, it's a relatively new field. So we haven't been the greatest at doing transition. So we are trying at some of the other major centers and here, to have a collaborative working group with Penn um, to train the adult colleagues so that we have good transition so we can get those numbers. So unfortunately, that's the best way that we can, we can do that. And then experience obtaining coverage for medical treatments. That is another very tricky um, question. So interesting, Serolimus has not been um, difficult to obtain not topically, so topically because it's compounded is very difficult to obtain, but oral serolimus off study has not been difficult to obtain because it is FDA approved for transplant. When we use serolimus in a study, because it's these diagnoses are not cancer, and this is our one of our biggest issues, there isn't a clause in insurance companies as there is with cancer that allows insurance companies to, to cover that. So we are working with our patient support groups to actually lobby um, insurance companies and also um, 
Congress eventually. So um, the LMI, the LGDA, uh, the KT support group is avidly working on that now. It is extremely hard to get things like trametinib that are FDA approved for other things, but are a very expensive drug. So we are working through pharmaceutical companies to obtain those um, and investigator initiated studies. Does anyone have anything else to add to that? It's, it's, very, it's very difficult and we need, we need to work at a much bigger level to answer those, to, to get answers to those questions. And uh, coverage is a major, major problem. Ah, so um, Hawken, I think this is for you. So this is from Dr. Borst, who's a colleague of ours at Vanderbilt. Um, what do you anticipate in terms of availability of cell-free DNA testing from cystic or pleural fluid in the future? Yeah, that is, uh, that, that is a great question. We have uh, ourselves been uh, sort of, you know, mastering a panel uh, with the most informative uh, genes. This is a PR-based uh, uh, assay where we uh, sort of, you know, have uh, taken uh, about 35 common, common genes and we run the samples uh, from the cell-free DNA Thin down, which usually yields a very small amount of DNA, as, as, as you know. Uh, but we run this at maybe 30, 40,000 reads. So we have a very deep coverage. So if there is a mosaic mutation impacting a small number of cells and a very tiny bit of DNA is circulating and reflected at that, we can typically amplify that and get, uh, get a signal. But this is still early in the development. I mean, uh, getting access to um, uh, cell-free DNA fluid, I mean, that is obviously an invasive uh, procedure. We are uh, getting access to the uh, cell-free DNA from either uh, uh, blood samples, so we isolate it from blood, but we also isolate it from the chylus uh, fluid, which is up. If there is a procedure, we have not yet sort of specifically just went in to get a cell-free DNA from a fluid if there was not an indication for uh, for uh, procedure, uh, but hopefully there will be biobanking effort and uh, uh, the uh, CVAP, uh, the uh, Canvas program that uh, Dr. Denise uh, spearheads. I mean, the, the goal there is to establish a biobank with all kinds of samples and make these samples available to any investigator. Great, thanks, Hawken. Okay. There's um, a question from Richard. Um, thanks everyone, great talks. Um, how long do you treat these patients with the various inhibitors like trametinib? Um, and have you pulsed the therapy to limit adverse events? and keep the vascular lesions in check? If so, how? So I can um, talk about at least the experience from serolimus. So remember, um, Richard, as you, as you know, these are congenital problems. We do not expect these to go away. When we did the first serolimus study, our response was based like a cancer response, but we knew there wouldn't be any complete responses. We know that patients are probably going to need these drugs perhaps lifelong. When I'm educating a family and teaching them, I sort of talk about that. Um, we have used serolimus, though. We try to, um, depending on the severity, treat with different drug levels, and then we try to decrease the amount of drug we're using that gives, so the lowest amount of drug that gives us the best response. And we also, for some patients with serolimus, learned that you actually can give them a drug holiday so you can treat, and then you can see if you can take them off of drug, and if symptoms come back again, you can treat. We don't know as much about um, the newer agents. So remember, serolimus was not, we had a hypothesis that this pathway was involved, and the only drug we had in that pathway was serolimus. That's how serolimus came about. Now we have more directed therapy, so we're learning about how that's going to affect um, the vascular anomaly. 
I assume that we're going to need drug for a long period of time, but we are not going to need the amount of drug that is needed in oncology diagnoses. And I assume that we will have periods of time that we're able to take someone off of drug. But remember, we are just entering the stage of sort of phase two um, uh, trials for this. I don't know if anyone else wants to add. Do you want to add anything, yeah. Kristen? I'll just add that the, the first patient that's been treated with tremetinib for with the ARAF mutation has been on it since 2017 with some uninterrupt with some interruptions um, for procedures. We have a few other patients who've also had interruptions for procedures that were planned, and there's been no changes um, otherwise. So the patients have continued to tolerate the drug well. And most patients have had to be decreased or have never gone up to the 0 0.025 milligram per kilo dosing. Um, that's the original recommended dose for the clinical trials melanoma. So there's a question um, from Daniela from Mexico City. And um, do you still do a biopsy um, or do you only do genetics? And so I wonder, Sarah, if you want to talk about yeah. the reason for why biopsy, and then there's another question that will go to you after that. And thanks for your question, Daniela. Um, so I think it really depends on what we're suspecting. So oftentimes, if we're suspecting a somatic condition, um, we do actually need the biopsy to send the testing. Um, you know, for example, if um, we're suspecting a PIK3CA-related overgrowth disorder, depending on what the phenotype is, um, we may be able to just have a skin biopsy of the, um, from like the overgrowth area of the limb, um, you know, or if it's a very involved venous malformation, um, which we didn't really touch on today that we think is localized, sometimes we can also just get a, a biopsy of the overlying skin. Um, but for example, um, as Dr. Snyder talked about, the individual that had that um, arteriovenous malformation that was excised, you know, if there's going to be an excision, we can always use the tissue from that as well. Um, so I think uh, just sort of circling back to answer your question, it's really important to consider what tissue you need. Um, and when we do send tissue for genetic testing, we do sort of do what we, you traditionally think of as a biopsy, as in we have the pathologist really look at it to kind of see what they actually are seeing. Um, and to make sure that we're really selecting the correct tissue to send for genetic testing. Great, thanks, Sarah. So um, the next is from Elizabeth Neiman. Thank you, Elizabeth, for being on. It's nice to see your name. Um, so this is about Wilms tumor screening. So um, what is your screening protocol for Wilms tumor rose patients, and does it depend on the subtype? such as um, MCAP or CLOVES or KTS. So I can tell you from the work that we did in Boston, um, all of the um, diagnoses of, of Wilms were really based on patients that truly fit that phenotype of CLOVES. So again, it's, you know, that it, there's a lot of heterogeneity. So KTS sort of overlaps with CLOVES, but but, but for people who are doing this all the time, I think we can differentiate KTS versus CLOVES. And we haven't found Wilms tumor in any typical KTS patients. So it's truly really been in CLOVES patients, and they have not found Wilms tumor in MCAT patients. But remember, this is fairly new. These phenotypes are fairly recently well-defined. So um, I personally... Uh, screen for Wilms tumor in patients with typical CLOVES, so a typical phenotype of CLOVES. I do not in KTS. I do not in in MCAP. Um, I think again registries are gonna are gonna help us out with this. I think the the percentage is is really small. Remember the people who got Wilms tumor uh, got Wilms tumor before the the age of four. So the question is, do you have to screen like um, Beckwith Wiedemann until eight years of age? I think most patients still screen with um, renal ultrasounds every three to four months until people are eight years of age because that's the standard for for overgrowth. I'm not sure that's necessary. I think people are looking in their registries, and I think more will come out um, related to that. 
but I, I know that's that's what what I would do. Okay, so um, this is from Stephen Durdak for PIC 3 ca associated GLA. What is the incidence of malignant transformation as patients transition into adulthood? If response to sirolimus, what is the role of adult holidays or does it need to be used continuously? So we talked about that a little bit. Is there evidence of emergence of resistance? So those are all very good questions. Um, I can speak about the transformation. So it is extremely, extremely rare for us to see transformation, but and it's unusual, right? Because these somatic mutations are somatic mutations seen in cancer. But after you've been doing this for a long time, so I've been doing this for 25 years, we actually had a patient with a lymphatic malformation who presented to us at 16 years of age with lymphangiosarcoma, and the lymphatic malformation was found um, on autopsy, unfortunately. We've had liver hemangiomas transform, and we know that there's been transformation into angiosarcomas. We do know that patients with clipotrinone that have lymphatic blebs that have been there for a while in their 70s or 80s have an increased risk for cutaneous lymphangiosarcoma or angiosarcoma. Um, so those are things that, again, why we need natural history studies and registries to monitor for this. Um, and then going back to your question about the adult adulthood, we, we hope that with some of these newer agents, we will be able to have people take drug holidays. And as far as the emergence of resistance, I do think that probably will happen. But we are in the beginnings of this, and that's why we need people like Dr. Hakonerson to figure out what the mechanism is of the therapies that we're using. Because even we might have MEK inhibitors and some of the MEK inhibitors might not work versus others. So it's really important for us to have people working in that translational realm as we start these clinical trials to help us with those questions. Does anyone want to add anything else to that? You know, I think uh, just in some uh, instances, I mean, we, we see even though there is a distinction between the, uh, the for example, the RASMAT kinase and the uh, PIK3CA and um, uh, M4 pathway, there is some uh, overlap between them and, and a dual, dual therapy may need to be considered in some instances, but this is something we will learn about probably over the next uh, a couple of years, uh, but this is sort of, you know, just an early uh, early indication from some of the patients we are treating. And then we'll take one more question, and please feel free to um, send us um, any of your questions. We'll be happy to answer them via email if you have if you have other questions. Um, but this is from Blanca Diaz, and it is our experience with Everlimus versus Sirolimus. So I so. You know, we started with sirolimus because Pfizer gave us sirolimus versus um, obtaining everlimus. I think they work similarly. I do think, though, that there are patients that tolerate everlimus um, a little bit better if they're not tolerating sirolimus. Um, so that is, I, I don't think one is more efficacious, though we haven't done studies to prove that. Um, but I do think if I have a young female who's having problems with sirolimus, I have switched over, probably used Everlimus in about 10 of those patients who have done better with Everlimus. Um, and it's been just as effective, but with less side effects. But I think that's vice versa as, as well. So we do not have any studies to actually prove that. So I really would like to thank you all um, for, for being part of this. Um, we're, we're really overwhelmed and grateful that we were allowed to lead off this series. We do think that um, vascular anomalies really belongs in the oncology world because of all the somatic mutations that we have that are simila similar to cancer. And I'm grateful for the amazing team that, um, that we have here at CHOP. And uh, today's event was accredited uh, for Category 1 CME. So everyone who joined and attended, you'll get a follow-up email uh, that includes a link to a feedback survey uh, that can both give us some information uh, about uh, your thoughts on today's event, as well as uh, that's how you'll get your CME. So we will send that out after.
great. Thank you very much for joining us.